So, so we begin lecture 5 in the midst of confusion. Is that okay? Is it working out? Can you see it? Okay, good. So, this is lecture 5. So in the last class, I think the last thing I did was write down some uh, definitions for random processes, discrete time as well as continuous time. But uh, I want to step down real quick and make a couple of plots of the Gaussian distribution. I think it's, it's important that we plot the Gaussian distribution. Several times you'll be asked to visualize it. It's good to see plots. So the Gaussian random variables. Uh, I'll show I'll show a very typical plot take 0 1 for instance okay if you plot the PDF of this uh, this variable the mean is going to be 0 and the variance is 1 what will be the value at x equals 0 okay what's fxx 1 by root 2 pi epa minus x squared by 2 okay so it's 1 by root 2 pi that's roughly 0.4 or so okay so that's the value and it will die down pretty fast on both sides and will it be symmetric? Yeah, it will be symmetric around, uh, around 0. So, how it will look. This is about 1 by root 2 pi. Okay. So, that's the, that's the, that's how the plot looks. So, if you do normal with mean mu and variance sigma square, that's going to move. This, this pretty much is going to move to the center as mu and it will also scale a little bit and you will divide by sigma, right? So, Depending on that, it will scale a little bit. Okay, so the two, the one-dimensional thing is not too bad. Okay, so you can you can quickly do it. It's not uh, it doesn't sound all that bad. So so that's the that's the first case. So the two-dimensional thing is a little bit more tricky. Okay, suppose I take uh, x y to be jointly Gaussian. Okay, jointly Gaussian IID. Okay, so IID unit normal. Okay, so how will the joint PDF look? You have to draw, draw it in two dimensions, right? So it's tough to draw a picture like that on the screen. So I'll, I'll roughly do a support type picture, okay? So you'll have, if you do f x y x comma y, okay, it will have its peak at 0, 0, right? And then it will die down in all directions in a circularly symmetric way, right? So that's the way to visualize it. So it'll have a peak, the peak value will be something and then it will circularly symmetrically die down in all directions. Okay. If your variances are not the same, if they are different, then that circular symmetry will be lost. Okay. The mean itself doesn't make a difference, but if the variances are different, that circular symmetry will be lost, but still it will die down in all directions in kind of a different asymmetric fashion. Okay. So if you have access to some plotting software, try some 2D plots of these functions with different mean and variance. I'll give you a picture of how the how the PMF or PDF looks in two dimensions. Okay, so this is an important picture to keep in mind. Okay, so that's one thing. As uh, okay, so why am I? There is some weird thing that's happening here. I don't know why, but I'm going to hide this. Okay, all right. So so um, so it's just a last question before we go on. I want to close the probability review with this last question. And I want to tell me what I want you to tell me what the answer is. Suppose I define a random variable y as x plus n. Okay, n is normal with say zero mean and variance sigma squared. X is uh, uniform in the set minus one to one. Okay, so when I say curly brackets, it's a finite set. Okay, so x is uniform in the finite set means what? X takes value one with probability half and minus one with probability half equal probability okay but if i use square brackets what does it mean if i do a b like this what is this okay so if i say x is uniform in this what is this it's a continuous random variable uniform between a and b so the pdf of x is 1 by b minus a between a and b okay so this is a small subtle variation in notation but the answers can totally change depending on what it is okay and so i'll say x and n are independent Okay, what's the PDF of Y? How do you go about finding such things? 
okay so you can do convolution right so even though it's discrete you write it in terms of deltas okay and you know what's the pdf for n so you convolve those two you get it okay so in terms of visualization it's easy to visualize it will be two gaussians centered around minus 1 and plus 1 with variance sigma squared but there'll be a scaling of half on each to make sure it works out suppose i say instead of uniform discrete if i say it's uniform continuous in the set say the same set minus 1 1 how will you do this okay it's a considerably more messy convolution okay but still it's a convolution right take the pdf which is a continuous pdf 1 by b minus a between a and b and then convolve it with the gaussian okay so it will be a little bit more messy but you can always get it okay, there's no problem in doing that okay if you want you can go to the fourier domain and do the convolution as a multiplication and then come back okay that's also a possibility okay so we'll be dealing with these kind of things often so i want you to get used to uh, something like this a similar thing can happen in two dimensions also right so if i have a vector of y y1 is x1 plus n1 y2 is x2 plus n2 a vector then i can think of it in two dimensions and similar picture will evolve okay all right so i think that's pretty much all i wanted to say let's go back to these random processes okay so i've been distinguishing between two type of processes discrete time and continuous time once again notice that i'm not saying the random variables themselves are discrete or continuous i'm only saying time is discrete or continuous in the discrete time case i had this uh, this kind of a notation in the continuous time case i have x of t so basically the ind index is either discrete or continuous okay so we think of the index as time it's okay it's not a big deal okay so how do you specify it you specify it by specifying what i called as finite distributions okay you take a finite number of random variables from this collection that you have okay you have a huge collection of random variables you take a finite number of them you should specify their joint pdf that's the proper way of complete way of specifying the random process but typically in practice we will never do that okay so how will we do it we'll always specify the what's called the sample function method of specifying the random process which is you'll specify x of t like a function of time okay like a function of time but involving random variables okay so based on what the random variables are you actually get new random variables for each t okay that's an indirect way of specifying the finite distributions as well because theoretically one can compute the finite distributions from such a specification okay all right so that's where i stop and uh, hopefully this is clear okay so so a very common way of specifying uh, typically the continuous time uh, distribution is this uh, I, i wrote down a way of doing it a cos say for instance omega t plus plus some phase phi okay so i might specify x of t like this okay where this a omega and phi can be either can be random variables in general okay some some random variables with a certain joint distribution i specify the joint distribution of a omega and phi those random variables themselves don't change with time but i have a variable t appearing explicitly in my sample function definition so if i give you a set of times t1 through tn you can plug it in here find all of them as functions of a omega and phi and then evaluate their joint pdfs how would you go about doing something like that how many of you think given t1 and t2 and a joint distribution for a omega and phi how many of you are confident that you can get the joint pdf in say half an hour is it a easy problem in this case it's not too bad okay so think about it it's not all that terrible but it can be done okay in general if you increase the number of time samples it becomes more complicated okay but in general it's more difficult but it can be done at least okay so if if you don't even know how to start a problem like that then you are in some kind of trouble okay go back and revise some of the notes you might have taken in 3 5 6 about transformation of random variables how do you deal with that how do you deal with this kind of indices and all that okay all right so let's uh, keep proceeding to proceed further i'm going to define two specific types of random processes we'll the first one is strixen stationary random processes okay so i'll i'll keep doing this uh, whatever i write on the left part of the screen will be for discrete time whatever i write on the right part of the screen will be for continuous time okay i'll do both together just keep on going okay so strict and stationarity has a very simple definition okay the okay so i i i need a notation uh, okay maybe maybe i won't do it okay so the pdf the joint pdf of xk1 xk2 
so until x k n for a set of n samples of my discrete time random process should be identical to the PDF of k1 plus delta k2 plus delta x k k n plus delta for all delta k i n ok so for any set of n samples I take it doesn't matter if I delay all of them by the same amount I should get the exact same join pdf ok as long as I keep getting that my discrete time random process is said to be strict sense stationary ok there is also a continuous time version what will I do in the continuous time version wherever I have k I am going to replace by t ok and then my delta can actually be a continuous index ok so that is how uh, I am going to specify for the continuous time case ok so I am not going to write down the continuous time case continuous time case definition is similar ok so you can figure it out it is not too bad alright so strict sense stationarity is very strong ok and typically typically when you do practical study of these random processes you are not worried about the pdf at all ok so the pdf is there you know but but it's still you know usually the signals are bounded between a certain a certain value you are not too worried about the entire pdf thing. knowing the exact probability distribution will not be so crucial to you the kind of things you need to know are the mean value the power and the spectrum ok so the average power the average uh, spectrum and the uh, the mean values those are the things Th those are the things that are very critical to you when you design ok so all these things are just second order things ok you don't need to know the complete joint pdf all the time ok so you are only worried about first order which is mean and power which is square of the thing right and square and in fact spectrum will be delay and multiplication so you will see ultimately you are only interested in second order statistics for your entire random process and that is enough for you to design systems ok so we will go ahead and define those first and second order statistics then we will be happy with that you won't be worried about specifying the entire joint pdf only the first and second order statistics of my random process ok so what is the first order statistic it is the mean ok so in the discrete time case it is very easy to define mx of k in general is expected value of xk ok so, so in the continuous time case I will have a similar definition mx of t is expected value of x of t what is this expected value over it's over the distribution of xk and the distribution of x of t okay and it's easy to evaluate in most cases okay the what's on the left hand side you can identify this will be what what kind of a quantity will this be will it be a random variable it will actually be a deterministic signal right so deterministic discrete time signal okay likewise here this will be a deterministic continuous time signal okay so already the first order statistic seems to be much simpler than the entire uh, random process definition you don't have to worry about so many things you just specify a discrete time signal continuous time signal which is much better for us okay so this is deterministic and that makes it uh, simpler to study okay the next uh, second order statistic it turns out it's not enough if you look at expected value of xk squared okay so that's enough for average power okay but usually you're interested in spectrum okay power as it changes as time changes how does my power profile kind of change okay with time that's what that's what you study in frequency right so to capture all that you do the proper correlative second order statistics that's the definition of autocorrelation okay so here's the definition rxx of k1 k2 is expected value of xk1 xk2 okay so i'm one more thing i should point out when i do uh, autocorrelation is usually we i'm defining this for real random processes okay so my xk is real okay usually always you think of random processes as real it's possible to define a pair of random variables and think of them as complex value okay it's possible in that case if your random variables are complex valued then the autocorrelation definition will change you'll have to conjugate one of the things okay so remember that i'm i'm in most cases in this course at least we'll be dealing with real random process if at all we need complex i will do a conjugation on one of those two things okay so remember that in the discrete time case also it's a similar definition rxx of t1 t2 is expected value of x of t1 x of t2 okay so i think my x of t2 has gone out of the screen okay, i'm sorry about that try to keep track of this all right so so this is the definition for autocorrelation and you can see it captures the variation of kind of power loosely with time 
okay so you multiply two of them together you get that and if k1 equals k2 what do you get you get the average power itself in the average energy so to speak at that time okay so that's it's once again instantaneous but it's okay at least you get something all right so the next definition is what's called for white whites and stationary random processes okay or wss for short okay so pretty much all the random process we'll be dealing with in this course will be whites and stationary okay so maybe one of them will not be whites and stationary but we'll quickly make it whites and stationary and work with it. okay so it's always whites and stationary the reason is you can define spectrum for these these type of processes so you want you want to have whites and stationary so what's whites and stationary two conditions need to be satisfied this mean instead of being a deterministic function of k will have to be a constant okay so i'm x for all k you should have the same mean in your random process definition and the autocorrelation once again if you evaluate it at k1 k2 or you evaluate it at k1 plus delta k2 plus delta should remain the same okay so you shift by a constant uh, number the autocorrelation doesn't change okay there are similar definitions in continuous time i'm not going to write it down and uh, that's how it works so this is whites and stationary okay so we'll like i said we'll pretty much be dealing with whites and stationary process because the spectrum can be nicely defined i'll, I'll go ahead and define it uh, in the next step so before that a quick question what is stronger strict and stationarity or whites and stationarity just by the name strict and stationarity should be stronger but there can be strict and stationary there can be whites and stationary random process that are not strict and stationary does it make sense yeah that can be right so you can have it's a weaker a weaker process usually we'll be doing that in the gaussian case you'll see it will coincide and all that uh, but there can also be strict and stationary random process which are not white and stationary does that make sense to you is it possible not possible okay so the trick lies in making sure you pick a random process for which mean and autocorrelation won't exist okay so it's possible to have random variables for which mean doesn't exist if mean doesn't exist you can't define white and stationarity right so you can you can cook up some strange process like that which will be strict and stationary but it will not be white and stationary so you can't think of strictly speaking you can't think of strict and stationary as a stronger version but in most cases since we'll be dealing with random variables which have a mean you don't have to worry about those kind of things okay so that's a minor technicality which you might come across sometime later okay all right so can you name a random variable which popular distribution which doesn't have a mean mean doesn't cauchy distribution doesn't have a mean okay mean doesn't exist okay all right so 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 let's let's go through and redefine this random the autocorrelation for the case when for the whites and stationary case it turns out since the shifts don't matter you don't have to take k1 and k2 it's enough if you have one variable and a shift right so it will work out very easily there so that's how it's defined for whites and stationary random processes okay so rxx of simply one variable this is expected value of xk plus m xk and m why, why can i write just m on the left hand side i know this is going to be independent of k it's going to be the same for all k whatever k i choose this quantity on the right hand side for a white and stationary process has to evaluate to be the same so it can only depend on m and it cannot depend on k so i can write just one definition okay in the continuous time case i'll use tau to denote this quantity here it will be t plus tau x of t okay so that's my uh, white and stationary definition okay so this so now the autocorrelation the mean becomes a constant and the autocorrelation becomes a deterministic signal right deterministic signal here also it becomes deterministic okay but it's continuous time okay so once it becomes deterministic and nice so it's simply one variable thing you can define a spectrum for it okay so you, you think of a fourier transform of the autocorrelation function as the spectrum of your random process so you see the white and stationarity is crucial in the spectrum definition otherwise you won't get a nice uh, spectrum definition okay so it's possible to make it rigorous and show it's indeed a spectrum we'll we'll do it kind of later in a inverse way i'll first define the spectrum definition okay so it's basically it's very very easy to define okay so you take the random the autocorrelation function and do a dtft on it you get what's called the uh, power spectral density for my for my uh, random process okay so this is the psd or the power spectral density 
for my random process. In the discrete time case, what transform will you take? You take a Fourier transform. In the continuous time case, I'm sorry. You take a Fourier transform and you get SXF. Once again, it's the power spectral density for my continuous time random process. Okay, you can show strictly that this is this represents some kind of power. I'll, maybe I'll, I'll motivate it later. But for now, you can take it as a definition. Okay, one can also take a Z transform here. Okay, and write the Z transform of the autocorrelation as some kind of the, I don't know what, what to call it. It's, it's a bigger set than the power spectral density, but it's also, it's also defined sometimes. Okay, we'll deal with this also several times. All right, so that's the that's, that's the spectrum. And uh, one last thing is cross correlation. Should I define it? No, yeah, I should define. It. I should define it. Okay, cross correlation between two random processes, both will be assumed to be. You will assume them to be what's called jointly Whitson stationary. We'll come to that later. So you have X Y being two random processes. Okay, and R X Y of K1 K2 is defined as expected value of X of K1 times Y of K2. Okay, so these are all just mundane definitions. There's a similar definition here, and uh, it's said to be X and Y are said to be jointly Whitson stationary. If what? Each of them have to be individually Whitson stationary, and in addition, this cross correlation should only be a function of K2 minus K1. Okay, so that's the other thing. Jointly WSS if RXY of K1 plus delta, K2 plus delta equals RXY of K1, K2. All right. So, so in that case, you can define the cross spectral density, cross cross correlation to be a function of just one random variable, which is simply, I'm sorry, a function of just one variable which is simply expected value of xk plus m xk okay so similar to what we had before okay so there's also similar definitions possible for the continuous time continuous time case i'm not going to spend too much time with that all right so that's uh, i'm sorry yes oh yk you're right sorry it's too close to lunch All right, so let's uh, let's proceed further. So the next thing that's important is filtering a. Uh, well, I'll, I'll I'll say Whitson stationary random process from now on. When I say random process, we'll assume it's Whitson stationary. Okay, so I won't repeat that. I'll simply say random process. You have to you have to assume it's Whitson stationary. Okay, suppose you have a random process coming into a filter with filter. With uh, trans with impulse response h of k, okay. So maybe the the discrete time Fourier transform is h of e per j omega. Maybe the z transform is h of z, okay. And you can show what you get out will also be a random process, okay. So I'm I'm changing notation here, so I should not do that. Sorry, six k going in and you you can show what you get out will also be another random process okay so how do you visualize this i mean when, when how do you think of this in practice you, I mean, what is this random variable coming in actually at any given time you will have an instance of this random variable coming in right so an instance of this random process coming in okay? so there can be several instances so you think model that as a random variable and study the average behavior okay so what will happen on average is what we are looking at okay there can be one instance where something else will happen Okay, but this is all averaged over all those instances. Okay, so that's what we are interested in. Okay, so you can show y k will also be a random process, right? And the mean of this random process, which will also be Whitson stationary, and the mean of this random process will be mean of x times what? One. Times this e power j zero. Okay, so that that's one thing you can show. Okay, and you can show the autocorrelation function of this random process. Is the autocorrelation function of the input random process convolved with hm convolved with h star of minus m? Okay, which is the match filter uh, response to this. Okay, and uh, from here you can show. Okay, in most cases this will be real, so h star is not 
too critical. From here you can easily show this will be Sx of e power j omega times what? Modulus of e power j omega square. Okay, so if you want if you want the z transform version, this will be Sx of z times h of z times what? H star of 1 by c star. Okay. So those are all uh, different versions of doing of saying the same thing. In the continuous time case, when you have x of t being input to a continuous time filter with uh, impulse response h of t, which has a Fourier transform h of f, okay, you can write a similar relationship. M y will be m x times h of zero, and then r y y tau will be a uh, similar expression. Okay, so r x x of tau. Convolved with h of tau convolved with h star of minus tau okay, and you can write sy of f as sx of f times absolute value of h of f square okay so all these things will also be true in continuous time you can show a lot of these properties okay so all of them are white and stationary process so you see why the spectrum is the, the autocorrelation function really represents the power in the signal and Sx of f can be thought of as the spectrum of the random process itself. Okay, so in, this, in the same way in which for discrete time what happens to the spectrum? Okay, in discrete time the spectrum gets multiplied by the transfer function. In, in the, no, I'm sorry, in deterministic case spectrum gets multiplied by the transfer function. In the random case the, the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function gets multiplied by the absolute square of the uh, transfer function. So th that's the correspondence. The reason why absolute square and all comes up is the power spectral density will have to be positive. Okay, you cannot have negative values. Okay, so the autocorrelation function will be such that its Fourier transform is positive everywhere. Okay, so well non-negative at least. Okay, so it cannot 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 go negative. So you can't have simply S X of f multiplying h of f. It won't make any sense. The mod square comes naturally there because of that reason. Right, so it will also be real, right? Sx of f will also be real. Okay, so those things I didn't write down. The PSD will be real and non negative. Okay, so that's uh, it's quite important. All right, so 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 so, so that's something I wanted to talk about. Filtering, okay. So the next thing we'll deal with is Gaussian random processes and those will dominate our study once again. Okay, so basically definition for Gaussian random process is simple both in discrete time and continuous time. What's the definition? All finite distributions are jointly Gaussian. That's the definition. jointly normal okay so it turns out whites and stationarity and strict and stationarity coincide in this case in the gaussian case there's no problem so so since we're assuming whites and stationarity everything will simplify tremendously okay so how do you specify a whites and stationary gaussian process you simply specify the mean and the autocorrelation okay any old function cannot be the autocorrelation the autocorrelation should satisfy a lot of properties Critical among them being its Fourier transform should be real and non-negative. Okay, so that's a very crucial property. Even so, so there are some restrictions on this Rxx of m, but pretty much once you specify a valid mean and a valid autocorrelation, that's enough. You specify the rand Gaussian random process completely. It's much simpler than specifying the finite distributions, and it's also much simpler than specifying even sample functions. So typically you don't function in, you don't specify uh, sample functions for Gaussian processes. You simply say mean and autocorrelation. That's good enough. Okay. I'm going to claim that from here you can calculate all the finite distributions. Okay. So any finite distribution you want can be calculated using simply the mean and the autocorrelation function. Okay. So this is the discrete time case. In the continuous time case, you'll have what? A similar thing. A mean and Rxx of tau. Okay. So these two things completely specify the Gaussian random process. Why is that true? Given these two, why can I find any joint PDF? Yeah, that's it. So all PDFs are simply defined by the mean and 
covariance matrix and can i find the covariance matrix from the autocorrelation function yeah what is the covariance matrix consist of it's basically expected value of some xi times xj okay which is the autocorrelation evaluated at j minus i okay so i know so once you specify the autocorrelation everything is specific okay so joint pdfs can be found using this okay so that's that's clear it's no problem okay a very special case of gaussian random process which we will study often is what's called white a white gaussian process okay so it's usually once you say white gaussian it's usually noise but still i'll simply keep it as white gaussian process a white gaussian process usually has zero mean okay so we'll we'll always take mean to be zero for a white gaussian processes and the autocorrelation function is special in the sense that it's going to be equal to in the discrete time n0 by 2 times delta m what's the discrete time delta when m is 0 it's 1 everywhere else it's 0 okay in the continuous time it's it's much more severe it makes it pretty much non practical it says the autocorrelation function is going to be n0 by 2 times delta tau okay so the first thing you should ask me is what is this n0 by 2 why n0 by 2 okay well it can be any constant okay you can keep it as some a or b anything you like but n0 by 2 is for historical reasons okay so whenever we whenever we assume white process you take the autocorrelation to have value n0 by 2 okay so some reason it's there we might as well accept it okay so if you do a power spectrum what will you get will be n0 by 2 for all omega here you will get n0 by 2 for all f okay so it will be a constant okay so so that's white the discrete time case is at least reasonable right you can expect maybe since you're sampling in discrete time consecutive samples to be uncorrelated but in the continuous time case what does it mean this n0 by 2 delta means however closely you sample right however closely you sample you should get independent random processes that's a little bit un- impractical okay but it turns out these noise processes typically that we model as white gaussian are generated with such a huge bandwidth okay so this sx of f is flat for such a huge bandwidth and normally you are working on such a small bandwidth typically that you can assume that this noise process is pretty much flat forever and since you anyway do a low pass filter in the beginning you'll only get a flat spectrum for the noise and that's good enough okay so that turns out to be a reasonable assumption okay so that's why this is uh, very useful so like i said noise is usually modeled as as a white gaussian process okay so this n of t that we had in our definition y of y of t equals x of t plus n of t n of t i said is a random signal right so that's usually modeled as a white gaussian random process okay so that's how it's modeled all right so the last thing i want to do as in terms of uh, things is this the last thing or do we have anything else Yeah, pretty much this couple of things last couple of things which we have to do is uh, the, these two things the first thing is sampling a continuous time random process okay so you you you, sim- you get a similar folding of the spectrum i just want to remind you of uh, how that works what happens when you sample a continuous time random process you have a continuous time random process x of t from here you take samples every t seconds to get a discrete time random process yk okay what is yk yk is x sampled at k times t okay so you from a continuous time random process you've gone to a discrete time random process okay so if the continuous time random process is specified by a mean and an autocorrelation function which has a power spectral density as x of f one can expect similar to the sampling theorem that the mean and the autocorrelation and the power spectral density of the discrete time process sample discrete time process will can be expressed in terms of the corresponding things for the continuous time case okay so that's what i'm going to describe right now okay so it's very easy to do it look look at yk equals x of kt so what should mean mean of yb expected value of yk will be what expected value of x at any time and you know it's white and stationary so it has to be equal to mx this no problem so the mean is not going to be change in any way what about r yym it's going to be 
expected value of y k plus m times y k. Okay, so convert that into suitable excess. You will see you can directly convert to a convert to this R X X. Okay, so you'll see this will work out to R X X of M T. Okay, so there's no problem there as well. Okay, but this R X X of M T now becomes a sampling of the of a deterministic signal, and you can directly apply your sampling theorem there and figure out that from here, if you take the discrete time Fourier transform for R Y Y, you're going to get 1 by T summation m equals minus infinity to infinity s x f minus m by t right so once you come to the discrete time case it becomes very simple okay what is this omega if you want to go back it will be 2 pi f t okay so if you want to go back to the physical sampling process that's how it works okay so you do get a folded spectrum in the in the random case as well okay but you get it for the power spectral density okay and when will you not have any aliasing when will you have the same type of statistic reflected even in the discrete time case when your bandwidth is uh, when your sampling frequency is at least two times the bandwidth of the original thing okay so once again this doesn't mean that you can reconstruct a random process or anything right it doesn't make too much sense right you can only reconstruct a statistic that's possible for the random process and that's possible if as long as there's no aliasing all right so that's also there. all right so the last last uh, bit of preliminary we need is uh, a special random process which requires careful study which i will call as the pam random process what is pam pulse amplitude modulation it's like all of you know what it is so the way it's defined is the following okay it's a continuous time random process it's defined using a discrete time random process okay so xk h of t minus kt okay so there are several things here this xk is a xk is a determine the discrete time random process maybe it has its own mean and autocorrelation function and power spectral density okay so all those things will exist so this t is some kind of a pulse duration okay so or symbol time if you will okay so i'll say simply say symbol time or pulse duration okay what is h of t h of t is some deterministic signal okay all right so first question what will y of t be y of t will be a continuous time random process that's clear will it be white and stationary only for some very special choices of h of t it will be white and stationary right if, if h of t at all varies you can immediately see it there's no chance of this being white and stationary in most cases so y of t in most cases will not be white and stationary and that's not a good situation for us why then you can't compute spectrum for y of t you can't design systems you won't know what bandwidth to allot you, you won't know anything okay right so that's something we don't want we want we want to have a good handle on bandwidth and all that so what we do is we introduce another random variable to make this white and stationary okay so this is a very standard trick you might have seen this before you do a timing offset type phase offset or whatever uh, new random variable so i'll say i'll define z of t as y of t minus theta where this theta is uniform in notice my notation 0t what does it mean theta is a continuous random variable which is uniform in the interval 0 to t okay and uh, i'll say theta is independent of xk and it's independent of everything else okay so once you do that you'll see you can write this this, this can be written even in terms of x xk h of t minus kt minus theta so once you do this it turns out z of t becomes white and stationary as long as h of t is bibo stable okay so you always need h of t to be stable even in the previous case whenever you filter you need h of t to be stable otherwise the mean itself won't be defined okay so you can't do uh, anything with that okay so z of t happens to be white and stationary this happens to be white and stationary and you can define mean and uh, uh, autocorrelation for it so i've forgotten what the mean is i think you can work it out it will depend on h of 0 and uh, mean of x okay so all that you can write down the important definition is for the power spectral density 
okay so remember this remember this by heart it's very very important 1 by t mod h of f squared s e power j 2 pi f t okay so what is this s now sx i'm sorry this is the power spectral density of the input random process remember it's a discrete time process so you have a dt ft and you convert back and forth between continuous and discrete with ft okay 2 pi ft then mod h of f square that's the standard uh, fourier transform then you get an extra 1 by t okay so that's all these things are crucial okay so usually this will be something very simple okay so you don't have to worry too much about it say for instance that will be a constant okay the power spectral density for x will be a constant okay you'll assume that it's independent xk will typically be assumed to be independent identical type of thing so that will be a constant so pretty much the spectrum of z is going to go like mod h of f square divided by t okay so that kind of makes sense if t decreases then you expect a larger spectrum right so by t and then mod h of f square should happen because that expression looks so much like a convolution between x and h okay so if you write out and simplify it should work out in a way similar to how convolution worked out okay so that's how uh, the spectrum uh, works out for this case okay so this expression you should know you should know by heart so may maybe this this last lecture was very crucial so as going along we'll take most of what i did in this lecture uh, into the next few well, into the rest of the course but it doesn't mean that you should neglect all the other things i talked about okay so particularly the gaussian random process stuff make sure you revise it go back and read some any of your favorite books on probability go through the gaussian random process go through transformation of random variables all those things will help you out a lot okay so as far as random signals are concerned it's enough if you know formulas like this okay but it's good to know discrete time fourier transform fourier transforms z transforms go and revise a little bit it will be comfortable okay so if you're looking for specific books okay so let me summarize briefly once again before i give you these book chapters and we'll close for today so the summary is we began by looking at the model for a communication system which is going to be x of t convolved with h of t plus n of t and the transmitter's job is to take in a sequence of bits and put out x of t the receiver's job is to estimate b by observing y of t okay so we want to design this tx and rx what are what are we concerned about as far as x of t is concerned i'm concerned about its power and bandwidth as far as n of t is concerned i'm concerned about its power okay and finally what are my parameters the design parameters that i want to optimize bit rate and and what probability of rate okay bit error rate maybe that's a nice way of putting it okay all right so after this we saw a whole bunch of review of signals and systems and we saw dsp a little bit and then we saw probability and random processes okay so so if you want a good reference okay in terms of books okay so i would suggest uh, okay so maybe the next page so mo almost almost all of what i wanted to do okay almost all of what i have done are in these book chapters if you take for instance barry lee and mesher smith it's in chapters 1 to 3 okay and if you take for instance uh, proacus fifth edition okay so i have the fifth edition with me so if you're using any other edition it might be first and second chapters okay so these two are good reads okay so if you're looking for something to read go back and pick up these books and uh, try to read them both both books must be available and most of what i did is condensed into these chapters here okay so it might be good for you all right so i think uh, we'll stop with this from next class onwards it's real digital communication okay so you better come prepared with all these things and otherwise you'll miss a whole bunch of things